Um, hello, everyone. Um, so, welcome to the postgrad seminar. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet on today, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past and present and the elders from um, other communities who may be here today. So um, it is with great pleasure that um, I introduce uh, James Finns, who is, a, who is a laboratory head in the information division here at Weihai. Um, his lab focuses on studying molecules um, involved in cell death and um, inflammation. His lab's research also um, discovered molecular links between apoptotic and um, necroptotic cell death and inflammatory cytokine production. Um, James's academic journey um, started at the University of Melbourne where he earned his PhD, where he delved into um, understanding protein trafficking and organelle biogenesis um, in Leishmania parasites. Then um, he embarked on um, doctoral fellowships at La Trobe University. Um, Currently, in addition to being a lab head at WeHi, um, James is also the scientific director of Mermaid Bio. Um, so today, James will be taking the stage to share his knowledge and insights um, regarding health and regarding cell death in health and disease. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, it's great to be here and to put together a, um, perhaps a, a talk that encompasses all known encoded cell death pathways. Um, so we'll, we'll jump straight into it. I'll, we might not get time to go through them all, but we'll stop at, I guess, what, the one hour point. So these are the uh, genetically encoded cell death pathways that have been well studied to date. Um, so we have the um, pyroptosis and here the effector of pyroptosis is this pore forming gasdermin D protein. Uh, I'm gonna get a pen up. Here we go. Um, so that's the critical effector of pyroptosis. For necroptosis, uh, which is the critical effector of necroptosis is this membrane damaging MLKL. And then we have our traditional apoptotic cell death pathways that can be divided into extrinsic apoptosis, which is mediated by death ligands and the activation of caspase 8, which is essential, and then intrinsic apoptosis. And the two central effectors of this are backs and back. And this is termed intrinsic apoptosis because these uh, um, locate on the mitochondrial membrane to induce mitochondrial outer membrane perforation and thereby triggering caspase 9 and subsequent caspase 3 and 7. So in the last 50 years, a lot of work into programmed cell death has identified its key roles in infections, cancer development, and also autoimmune inflammatory diseases. And we'll, we'll go into a bit of detail on these in this talk. So we'll start with the apoptotic cell death. So um, the observations really on cell death were really reported quite early on around 1842. But from then on, there was really limited recognition of its importance in um, mammalian viability and responses to infections. In the 1960s, there were several labs that demonstrated that cell death was biologically controlled and wasn't actually just a result of um, gross physical insults. And then in 1972, there was this key paper, and this is um, with uh, John Kerr, Wiley and Curry, and this actually came out of um, Queensland University, this key paper. And here they really defined the morphological process of cell death that was common throughout different tissues. <laughs> and this morphological sort of you could call criteria for apoptosis uh, included nuclear and cytoplasmic condensation, DNA fragmentation, membrane blebs, which we now call apoptotic body formation, and then the removal of these apoptotic bodies by healthy cells. And this is just a schematic from that seminal publication showing pretty much, uh, you know, maybe not as fancy as today, but what we still would describe as apoptotic cell death, where you get condensation, fragmentation, and uptake by phagocytes to clear these apoptotic bodies in an immunologically silent manner. And they obviously, at the time, this was 
40, 50 years ago, they stated that many problems remain to be solved. The factors that determine which cells will be affected, the mode and actions of initiators and inhibitors of cell death, and the earliest biochemical and morphological events and the mechanism of the cellular condensation. And so since then, in 1972, by 1990, um, scientists had started to unravel the genetics of apoptosis. Some, some of the critical players had been identified, such as BCL2, caspase 3. And then in 2002, the Nobel Prize was given to Brenner Horvitz and Solston, for, who first characterized really the, some of the key cell death effectors in worms and then showed they were conserved in mammals. So, as I said before, the, the study of program cell death didn't really take off um, until the function of BCL2 was discovered. This has really revitalized interest in program cell death and how it might be manipulated um, to treat disease. So this is named BCL2, it was named B-cell leukemia lymphoma gene number two, and it was shown to be overexpressed in cancers. And at the time, it was thought to be an oncogene. It was going to, they thought it was going to drive cell growth and proliferation. But David Vo, who was a PhD student at Weehai at the time in Jerry Adams and Suzanne Corey's lab, he actually showed it wasn't an oncogene, but, and it didn't drive cell growth and proliferation, but it actually prevented cell death when it was expressed in cancer cells. And so this identified BCL2 as an inhibitor of cell death and its ability to synergize with known oncogenes such as MYC. Uh, subsequent to that, um, it was shown that there was BCL2 transgenic mice, and a lot of this work at WEHI showed that BCL2 protects against a wide range of cytotoxic toxic agents to prevent cell death. And then a number of other pro-survival BCL2 family members that acted similarly to BCL2 were identified in 1993, such as MCL1 and A1. And then I guess the other big discovery here was in, in 1995, uh, apoptosis was separated into two pathways, the intrinsic pathway and a BCL2 independent pathway termed death receptor apoptosis, which we'll get into. So since then, um, this is where we stand with our knowledge of cell death, as all of this has been uh, re elucidated over the past 30 years. So in intrinsic apoptosis, we have a number of anti-apoptotic members the BCL2 family members, which are pro-survival. And there's BCL2, BCLXL, MCL1, BCLW, and A1. And they all inhibit Bax and BAC, but they can also, and, and this prevents Bax and BAC oligomerization on the mitochondrial membrane to induce mitochondrial outer membrane permeability, the release of cytochrome C, which nucleates this apoptosome complex to activate caspase 9, and caspase 3 and 7, which have many targets in the cell to induce apoptotic cell death. At the same time, we have these BH3 only proteins here. And there's a few here listed such as Puma, BIM, Noxa, BID, and BAD. And these all can directly, some of these can directly activate backs and back, but they also antagonize these pro-survival BCL2 family members to allow backs and back activation on the mitochondrial membrane. So as I mentioned earlier, this apoptosis and this cell de these cell death pathways are evolutionary conserved. So early experiments, for example, took BCL2 uh, from humans and showed if you expressed it in worms, you could block programmed cell death in worms by expressing human BCL2. And since then, a number of these conserved cell death regulators, such as caspases, have been shown to be uh, functional in different species. <laughs> And I'll just note here that, that it's thought maybe one of the primordial functions of uh, these caspases in cell death is not actually cell death itself, because it's been actually shown a lot of the eukaryotic, eukaryotic caspases can be involved in other, other um, signaling pathways in terms of there's some here, such as caspase 3, which can regulate uh, differentiation of bone marrow cells and indeed other processes such as growth and proliferation. So this could be a primordial function of the caspase family. That's... So obviously with the observation that uh, BCL2 could be overexpressed and prevent cancer cell death, there was then a big rush to identify the structure of BCL2, how it functioned, and then with the knowledge of how BH3-only proteins bind and inhibit BCL2, 
uh, the development of what is now known as these BH3 mimetics for the treatment of cancer. Um, so I'll just highlight here, there's been a number of these compounds identified. There's some such as ABT737, which inhibit multiple pro-survival mem family members, BCL2, BCLXL, and BCLW. And there's one, some that only in target one. And this ABT199, which only targets BCL2, is what we now know as venetoclax, which is in the clinic to treat cancer. There's a number of others. There's one's being developed against BCLXL, and also you can see down here MCL1, and these are all in clinical trials. So obviously this has been proven that if you induce cell death, this can be a, a good way to uh, develop new treatments for cancer. But what became apparent was that at the time was that perhaps we could repurpose these BH3 medics or targeted cell death drugs uh, for other diseases. And one of the ones that stood out was um, infections because it's been known for a long time that if you inhibit cell death, this can enhance pathogen replication within cells such as viral production, as well as bacterial production. And while cell suicide can limit um, intracellular pathogen infections. And here says just, just the number of these, these are all different viruses here. This is quite an old table, but you can see here, these all encode inhibitors uh, to that block apoptotic cell death. And we'll spruik some of our work, which I think maybe was one of the first studies to show you could repurpose uh, BH3 mimetics to treat infections. And here we asked, uh, can apoptotic signaling be activated to treat uh, Legionnaire's disease? And this is an intracellular pathogen that resides in macrophages. And at the time, we weren't sure what would happen. Would, would If we induce cell death, would it cause inflammation? Would it cause bacterial dissemination and perhaps make disease worse? Or would it promote disease clearance? So what we started off was using these novel tool compounds that target specific BCL2 family members and infected uh, macrophages with uh, Legionella, the intracellular bacterial pathogen. And what we, recent, what we discovered both genetically by knocking out BCLXL as well as using targeted BH3 mimetics was that you could induce this rapid cell death if you lost BCLXL. And as a consequence, these cells no longer provided a niche for bacterial replication. So you can see here in the colony forming units in the BCLXL knockout macrophages, you have dramatically reduced numbers of bacteria compared to wild type macrophages. And this was on target, this was due to back back signaling. So as you can see here, again, if you measure the number of bacteria in a macrophage, if you inhibit BCLXL with these BH3 medics, again, you reduce the bacterial burden of these macrophages. But if you knock out Bax and back, the effect is of mitochondrial apoptosis. This restores the ability of the bacteria to replicate. And this panned out in vivo. Um, so again, if we only to delete uh, BCLXL from myelate cells or the macrophages within mice, and then infect these mice with Legionella and look at the bacterial burdens in the lung, the BCLXL knockouts often have uh, levels of bacteria that are b below the level of detection. And again, if you look at survival of these mice, losing BCLXL only in the macrophages prevents lethality compared to wild type mice. Uh, the BCLXL knockout mice don't drop in weight, as you'd expect. And again, this can be mimicked by treatment with BH3 mimetics. So if, again, if you take a, a BCLXL targeted BH3 mimetic or a pan BH3 mimetic, this reduces the bacterial burden. And again, this promotes survival. So following on from this in two years later, a really nice paper came out by a Japanese group in PLOS Pathogens. And they showed the same hold true for um, flaviviral infections. So these include uh, viruses such as Japanese encephalitis virus and Zika virus. And what they showed here, if you just knock out one allele of BCLXL, so they still express half the amount of BCLXL and infected these mice with Japanese encephalitis virus, the BCLL Nexel knocks out showed improved survival. And so what we had discovered and they discovered was that it was only the infected cells that were dying. So the question was really was, why are only infected cells dying when you lose BCLXL and not the healthy cells? 
And what uh, we and, and this Suzuki found was that it's because the infected cells uniquely lose the other pro-survival member, MCL1. And here's an example here where they've infected cells with Japanese encephalitis virus, dengue or Zika. And you can see over time they lose MCL1. And so by losing MCL1, you sensitize these cells to BCL-XL inhibition. And the combined loss of BCL and XL and MCL1 suffices to activate Max and back and induce cell death of the infected cells. So this is just summarizing, I think, where we're at. This, these, um, these cell death drugs might not just be good for treating cancer, but as uh, we and others have now shown, uh, you can target these infected cells. They inhibit host cell protein synthesis by taking over the cellular translation machinery. This reduces short-lived proteins such as MCL1, and this sensitizes these macrophages to BCL-XL antagonism and cell death, and this clears the infection and reduces infl inflammation. So that's a bit of the, a summary of um, intrinsic apoptosis and how it might be harnessed to treat disease. And we'll move on now to extrinsic apoptosis mediated by death ligands and the activation of this initiator caspase, caspase 8. So these are, these are the main death ligands that initiate extrinsic apoptosis. Um, there's these death ligands FAS and TRAIL, and they signal cell death. They have uh, death domains in the cytosolic, uh, on the cytosolic face of the receptor, and these death domains can oligomerize with death domain containing proteins such as FAD. And this FAD, through its death effective domain, recruits in caspase 8 into what's known as a death-inducing signaling complex. Um, on the other hand, TNF binds TNF-01, and this is a slightly different complex. This is internalized, and when survival is inhibited, uh, you have a TRAD, another death domain can protein, death domain containing protein recruits FAD to oligomerize and activate caspase 8. And here, this apoptotic caspase 8 cleaves the executioner caspases, caspase 3 and 7, to initiate apoptotic cell death. So as I mentioned, TNF cell death is a bit more complicated in that normally TNF does not actually signal cell death. Normally in healthy cells, TNF binds to its receptor, TNF receptor 1, and this actually results in a cell surface signaling complex where we have these key proteins, cellular inhibitor of apoptosis proteins, which are ubiquitin E3 ligases. And this allows the ubiquitination of this uh, receptor interacting in protein kinase 1 or RIP1. And then this, this ubiquitolated or modified RIP1 allows activation and NF-kappa B signaling. And as a result of this NF-kappa B signaling, you get the generation of inflammatory mediators as well as pro-survival proteins, such as the cellular inhibitor, inhibitor of apoptosis proteins themselves, as well as caspase 8 inhibitors such as CFLIP. So normally, you only get TNF signaling when the cellular IAPs or other pro-survival proteins such as CFLIP are removed. And this became of interest um, because if we could um, antagonize these pro-survival proteins, we might have another means to induce cancer cell death. So within the inhibitor of apoptosis protein family, there's not only cellular CIP1 and 2, but there's also X-linked IAP. And basically these have a conserved domain structure where they have these baculoviral IAP repeat domains. Um, and then they have this C-terminus ring domain, which confers ubiquitin E3 ligase activity. And as you might have observed, although I didn't mention, in mitochondrial apoptosis, there's this IAP binding protein called SMAC, which is released. And this actually contains a motif which binds and inhibits X-linked IAP um, to help promote cell death. So based on the known interaction of XIP with the um, caspases and the mode of inhibition of caspase activity, um, there's the design of smac mimetic IAP antagonist drugs. So this schematic here just shows how um, the IAP protein or XIP through its BIO3 domain combined and inhibit caspase 9 or three, uh, through this linker and bi 2 domain combined and inhibit caspase 3. And when SMAC is released from the mitochondria, this competes or outcompetes 
um, XAP binding to caspase 9. So this then frees up caspase 9 and 3 for, for activity. So this can be shown again, this is, uh, we again at WeHi showed this back in 2007, that if you just inducibly express uh, cytosolic SMAC, which antagonizes IAPs, or indeed if you take the, um, the insect equivalent GRIM, which is conserved with SMAC, and express these in cancer cells and measure cell death, you can get a robust cell death in cancer cells upon expression of GRIM or SMAC. This is just two different cancer cell lines. And so based on the no, known mechanism by which this is the N-terminal SMAC peptide, and this is the structure of it binding to the IP, and based on this structure, there's the design of these SMAC mimetic drugs that mimic uh, SMAC binding to IAPs to inhibit apoptosis to promote apoptosis. And there was a number of pharma companies at the time which all developed these IAP antagonist or SMAC mimetic drugs. And this is just some of the affinities for binding. You can see they have very low nanomolar affinities, some of them for binding both CIP1, CIP2 and XIP. But pretty much they're all based on the design on the idea that XIP, which is a known caspase inhibitor, they're all designed to inhibit XIP to induce apoptosis. So what was really surprising at the time was that it was found that these magnetic drugs actually, although they target XIP, they actually cause the proteasomal degradation of CIP1. So this is just one magnetic drug, compound A, and it's been added here to cancer cells. And you can see when you add compound A, you completely lose CIP1 protein. And it was found that this was key for the cancer cell responses responsiveness to smoke mimetics and the loss of CIP1 itself, not XIP, sensitized cells to um, TNF-induced cell death. And this was shown genetically here, where if you add TNF onto XIP knockout cells compared to wild type, you don't really see much of an increase in cell death measured on the y-axis. But if you lose CIP1 genetically, these are dramatically sensitized to TNF killing. So this really came up with the mechanism by which these SMAC mimetic uh, drugs work. Um, although they target XIP to sensitize apoptosis, they really have to hit the cellular inhibitor of apoptosis proteins to cause their proteasomal degradation. Now, what this triggers at the time we showed was that this actually activates this non-canonical NF-kappa B signaling pathway where you get stabilization of NF-kappa B inducing kinase because the IAPs normally degrade this through the proteasome. So when you lose IAPs, this gets stabilized and this gets activated, this non-canonical NF-kappa B pathway. This drives TNF transcription. And because you've lost CIPs within the cell, you now sensitize cells to TNF-induced apoptosis. So following on from this, a number of these SMAC mimetics have entered clinical trials. This is just a, a xenograph mouse model where the, um, one of the um, IAP antagonists, Compound A, was used to treat mice and showed it completely prevented tumor growth at quite low doses. Um, so a number of these entered clinical trials. This is a few years ago now. And I think a lot of these have um, subsequently failed clinical trials and really because A, the SMAC mimetics, they have to penetrate into the tumor and that can be difficult to achieve and B, um, there was no stratification of the, um, the tumor's responsive, responsiveness to TNF. So again, for these to have the best chance of working, you've got to target tumors that are going to respond uh, to TNF-induced cell death. So again, at the time, um, subsequent to this, it was asked, well, could we use this knowledge on how IMP antagonists work to sensitize uh, cells to TNF killing? Could we use it again to treat intracellular infections? And a lot of this again was performed at WeHi, leading the way, a lot of it in Mark Pellegrini's lab. And this is one recent paper where they showed in response to TB infection, if you treat with these IAP antagonists, two different types, one from Novartis and one from Tetralogic Pharmaceuticals, uh, you could really reduce the bacterial burdens of TB in the lung, as shown here in the IAP antagonist-treated mice. You could reduce the bacterial burdens in the spleen. And again, um, this is just showing over time, with treatment time, again, you limited, you could control the infection. 
this was shown also for hepatitis B. This is uh, work performed by Greg Ebert at WeHi, who now runs a lab in Munich. And he showed again uh, treatment with these IAP antagonists in red and blue here, really reduced the detectable levels of hepatitis B in mice compared to vehicle controls. In terms of parasite infections, it's been shown again by Greg Ebert fairly recently that if you treat uh, again mice with berinopant, Again, you can delay or reduce the parasitemia with, uh, this is plasmodium or malaria infections in these mice. And again, you significantly prolong survival. So this is all well and good. Um, this is nice showing that apoptosis can protect in, against the infection. But the other flip side to the coin is could too much apoptosis cause actually cause inflammation and potentially cause tissue damage and increase disease severity. And again, um, just a little bit biased, but this is something we've looked into recently with a PhD student in the lab, Daniel Simpson. And what he showed was that if you took pathogen ligands that activate toll-like receptors, um, there's so such as lipopolysaccharide found on gram-negative bacteria or a double-stranded RNA mimic such as polyIC found in um, RNA viruses um, and treated them with host-derived interferon gamma, this could induce a caspase 8 dependent cell deaths. And so the question he asked was how do how do interfe how does interferon gamma priamine sensitize cells to um, caspase eight killing? One of the key genes he found upregulated in response to interferon gamma priming was INOS and the generation of this uh, nitric oxide, which is a, a reactive um, sort of a, a, a very um, sort of like reactive oxygen species can. Um, really promote cell death and it's long been associated with cellular toxicity. And it could really show that the generation of nitric oxide or INOS, the gene that in, um, is responsible for NO production was required for caspase 8 killing and somehow turned on caspase 8 to induce macrophage death. And this is just the example here where we've derived NOS2 knockout macrophages. And you can see here, these are the wild type cells which are all dying by there is only about 20% left viable here. You can see in the um, INOS deficient macrophages, which can't make nitric, nitric oxide, these are all uh, survive, surviving. So we asked in the context of infections, of viral infection, in this case, at the time it was, um, and still is quite important. This is a, a SARS-CoV-2 infection model, um, which mimics uh, COVID-19 disease pathogenesis in mice. And it was published in 2021 that the, um, there was a correlation with NOS2 expression levels and disease severity in COVID-19 patients. And so we, um, again, we uh, analyzed our mice in, uh, in this COVID-19 model where these mice were infected and then we looked at the viral titers in the lung. And you can see here in the NOS2 knockouts, there's really not much difference in the levels of viral burdens in the lung. But which, what was very apparent was that while well, wild-type mice lost weight, um, just deletion of one allele or both alleles of INOS protected from this virus-induced weight loss despite not impacting viral burdens. And again, this was mimicked in the caspase 8 knockouts here. So if you lose caspase 8, you don't really affect viral burdens in the lung. But again, by losing caspase 8 here, you protect from weight loss compared to the wild type mice, suggesting that this um, INOS triggered caspase 8 apoptotic pathway can in increase disease severity if it occurs too much. So um, that's the extrinsic apoptosis. Um, we'll move on now to pyroptosis. So this is really perhaps arguably the primary pathogen defense mechanism of cells against uh, viral, um, bacterial and fungal pathogens. And this pro-inflammatory cell death pathway was first described in 1992 as a response to um, bacterial infections, Shigella and Salmonella. And this pyroptosis, pyro, which stands for fire in Greek, um, was called pyroptosis by Cookson and Brenner in the year 2000. This was defined as being a caspase one dependent lytic cell death pathway, which was pro-inflammatory. The uh, protein complex within cells was defined that activates caspase one was defined by Jörg Chop in Switzerland in 2002. And then it was another 13 years before the um, actual substrate of caspase one that mediates pyroptosis was identified. So 13 years later, 
Um, there's Vishwa Dixit's lab at Genetech and the Feng Xiao's lab in China, in Beijing, which both showed at the same time that caspase 1 cleaves gazdermans to, and these gazdermans form pores to induce pyroptotic cell death. And so this is the basic concept of pyroptosis here. As I said, you have chopped to find that these inflammasome proteins are formed in response to pathogen infections, and there's a number of different sensor proteins which sense distinct ligands. These nucleate the adapter ASC, or, and this adapter ASC through a, a caspase activation and recruitment domain binds a caspase 1, which also contains this caspase activation and recruitment domain. This oligomerizes caspase 1, dimerizes, it gets activated, and then it cleaves the N-terminal of uh, gazdermin D. Well, just downstream of the N-terminal, this releases the N-terminal of gazdermin D, which goes on to form pores in the plasma membrane, resulting in a loss of um, plasma membrane integrity and the lytic cell death known as pyroptosis. And this is the structure of the gazdermin D pore, which was recently solved by Hao Wu's group. At the same time, which was known before how caspase 1 enacts pyroptosis, caspase 1 in part is largely pro-inflammatory because it cleaves these inactive precursor inflammatory cytokines, IL-18 and IL-1-beta. So these are normally reside in the, in the cell. Caspase 1 cleaves these to their bioactive fragments, and these actually exit the cells through the gazdermin D pore. So this gazdermin D pore has a negatively charged inner face. So the net charge of these activated cytokines are positively charged, so it actually has a slight preference, both in terms of the size of these activated cytokines, as well as their charge for allowing their escape from the cell where they can initiate inflammation. So as I mentioned, there's a number of these sensor proteins. There's pattern recognition receptors, which recognize specific viruses and, and bacteria. So there's AIM-2, and this detects uh, uh, double-stranded DNA and binds double-stranded DNA to be activated. There's the NAEP NLRC4 inflammasome complex, which detects type 3 secretion system components of bacteria to activate this NLRC4 inflammasome. And then there's these guard proteins, which sort of detect a loss in cellular homeostasis. So NLRP3, one of the most widely studied is activated through potassium ion influx. And this can occur downstream of numerous um, cellular stresses, such as pore forming toxins and in response to lysosomal damage and mitochondrial poisons. Um, pyrin, the pyrin inflammasome detects perturbances to the bacteria, the cytoskeleton. And some of these are induced by bacterial toxins and this activates the pyrin inflammasome. Needless to say, they all activate caspase one to cause gazdermin deactivation and pyroptosis. Now, here's a very long list. <laughs> I just want to highlight here the importance of, of um, potentially pyroptosis or more in, or inflammasome activation for protection against uh, pathogenic infection. So here we have um, these inflammasome or pyroptotic deficient mice, the strains used down here. There's, there's caspase 111s, there's pyrin knockouts, there's NLIC4 knockouts and really focus here on the survival. Um, so here you can see very much in this knockout column, the survival is often reduced to 0% of these mice when infected with these bacteria, whereas the survival of wild type um, mice often, you know, when they survive 100% viable, the knockouts are, are mice are dead. So this is in response to numerous bacteria. We have this, um, I'll just run through them all. There's a lot here, again, focusing on the knockout survival compared to wild type survival. These are the different bacteria. Again, you see these big differences, 75% survival, 0% in caspase 1 knockouts, for example. Again, you've got TB infection, pseudomonas infection, salmonella infection. Again, all of them, or a lot of them, show reduced survival. Um, we will go through these quickly. This just sort of emphasizes the amount of work that's been done with inflammasome. There's a lot of viruses here, again, which have been studied in terms of inflammasome protection from viral infections and then into fungi, which again, you see in response to some fungi such as Aspergillus and Candida. Again, you have some protection uh, when you have an inflammasome present. All right, so it's clearly important these inflammasomes are important for protection from a wide variety of uh, pathogens, but they also 
are known to drive autoinflammatory diseases. So here are the different sensor proteins, pyrin, NLRC4, NLRP1, NLRP3. And it's now been identified in humans as activating mutations in these inflammasome sensor proteins which drive autoinflammatory disease. A lot of these, such as the autoactivating mutations in NLRP3, are effectively treated by inhibiting the inflammasome activated R1 beta. So there's biologics or antibodies against R1 beta that can treat a lot of these conditions. Some of them it doesn't work. Some of them it's thought that the other inflammasome activated IL-18 drives disease, or some of them it could be actually pyroptosis itself. In other uh, diseases that are thought to be mediated by pathological inflammasome signaling, a lot of these are particle-like diseases. So, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, you get the buildup of these amyloid plaques or amyloid particles in asbestosis and gout form caused by uric acid crystals. These have all been shown, these particles, to activate pathologically NLP3 signaling. And again, at least for gout, it's been shown blocking R1 beta has therapeutic benefits. Um, and at the at, as, as it stands in mouse models, there's pretty good evidence if you knock out NRP3 in mouse models, you can protect against neurodegeneration such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. But this is yet to um, translate into the clinic. One of the issues here is getting biologics or even small molecules to penetrate the CNS or the blood-brain barrier. So it's not just in, in um, mutations in humans in inflammasome sensors that can cause autoinflammation through inflammasomes, but there's also, as I referred to earlier, these inhibitor of apoptosis, inhibitor of apoptosis proteins, as well as a number of other pro-survival death receptor proteins, which have also been shown to be mutated in humans to cause autoinflammation. And here I'll, just because our lab works on it a lot, um, in XIP deficient humans, these have these are very these patients are very susceptible to pathogen triggered cytokine shock syndromes, as well as inflammatory bowel disease. And this is just an example of the um, extremely high levels of this inflammasome activated IL-18 in XIP deficient patients. And at the time, well, it was we didn't really know how XIP acted because it had no link to inflammasome signaling. How it acted to block. Um, excess um, inflammasome activated cytokines. And we managed to show that it's because XIP actually prevents pathogen toll like receptors from activating NLP3. And so you lose XIP, you um, get heightened NLP3 activation, and then the generation of active R1 beta and IL 18. But obviously, with NLP3 signaling, XIP is linked to apoptosis, and it's also linked now to pyroptosis. So, what occurs in vivo? So this is a recent study we performed with Yu Shi Zhang's group um, in China, and she identified XIP deficient patients with severe inflammatory bowel disease. This is very early onset IBD in ch children. And then these two patients in the inflamed colonic mucosa, you can see, you can really detect the activation of gazdermin D. And this is just quantified here. And at the same time, you get detection of apoptotic caspases. And here they've um, stained for cleaved or active caspase 8 in these two patients. So you're getting signatures of both apoptosis and pyroptosis in these XIP deficient patients. And so genetically we managed, well, through a lot of genetics in macrophages, we managed to map out here that when you inhibit XIP or lose XIP in the case of patients, uh, you get excess caspase 8 activation, which can cause apoptosis. But at the same time, we showed that caspase 8 activates NLP3, and this can cause um, pyroptosis. And you actually can't block cell death in XIP deficient cells unless you remove both apoptosis and pyroptosis. Another example of this cell death plasticity or, or crosstalk in is, occurs in infection. So this is that was performed at Wehi, again, Marcel and Andreas Strasser's group. And this is in response to salmonella infection. So here you can see they've knocked out these pyroptotic caspases and it delays cell death, but doesn't block it in response to intracellular salmonella infection. Um, again, you can block out pyroptosis and apoptosis. Um, and again, you don't see any decrease, uh, difference in cell death. However, if you... Uh, 
It's cut off here, but if you knock out both pyroptosis and apoptosis, now it's only now that you completely prevent cell death in response to salmonella infection. And as I alluded to before, and it's shown in with the IAP antagonists and BH3 medic studies, this cell death is crucial for control of infection. Because if you look here, if you knock out pyroptosis and apoptosis in these mice, they now become incredibly susceptible to salmonella-induced lethality and their bacterial burdens uh, amplified compared to wild-type control mice. So here's a messy schematic um, that was written up for this paper, but it just goes to show that there's a lot of redundancy and plasticity in cell death ceiling. This is something that's recently been defined for both autoinflammation and infections. And so if you want to block disease-promoting cell death, you actually might need a drug or a compound or something that inhibits several cell death pathways at the same time. And indeed, it's been speculated in some clinical trials that this could explain the clinical failure of some anti-cell death drugs. So there was one good one in where they were trying to treat um, uh, liver toxicity uh, with a pan-caspase inhibitor to block pretty much all the caspases. And this failed, and there it was speculated it's because if you inhibit caspases, um, other cell death pathways such as necroptosis or even pyroptosis can step in and still cause pathology. So I'll just end pyroptosis on this. This is really a new cell death either. This is a very recent finding. So I've talked about Gazdermin D here, but in the last really only the last two years or so, it's been shown these, there's obviously D, there's a number of Gazdermin family members, A, B, C, D, and E. And now in the last couple of years, it's all been the, the proteases that activate these gazodermins to form pores in the plasma membrane have started to be defined. And here I've just elucidated. It's actually been shown that what was previously referred to as secondary necrosis downstream of apoptosis, so if the apoptotic cells couldn't be cleared, they sometimes became, a, they were observed as having a necrotic cell phenotype. And it's now been shown that this apoptotic caspase in cells that express gazodermin D, it can actually cause pyroptosis via caspase 3 cleavage of gazodermin E. I will leave it there and um, move on now from um, pyroptosis to our last cell death pathway, necroptosis, which again is intensively studied at WEHI. So this is a bit of history. So necrosis was initially characterized as cell swelling, causing the plasma membrane to burst. And this release, results in the release of cytoplasmic contents into the surrounding tissue, causing an inflammatory response. And, you know, historically it was thought necrosis was non-programmed, but it was shown that, in fact, back in 1988, that TNF itself can induce both apoptotic and necrotic forms of cell lysis. And then... You know, um, 10 years later, in 1998, it was shown that you can, you know, this necrotic cell death mediated by TNF occurred in the absence of caspase activity. So it wasn't a caspase-dependent cell death. So you treated cells with caspase inhibitors that actually sensitized them to TNF-induced necrosis. And this, you might realize, this is the same group that defined the inflammasome complex, your CHOPS groups. This was this pivotal paper back in 2000, which really identified genetically uh, programmed necrosis depended on this recept death receptor signaling component receptor, inter receptor interacting protein kinase 1. That was back in 2000. In 2005, there was an inhibitor of this uh, RIPK1 mediated necrotic cell death, but it was, it was another nine years before it was showing these three papers here that RIPK1 activates RIPK3 to cause necrosis. And then in 2012, three, year late, three years later, uh, Zedong Zhuang group over in Beijing showed that RIPK3 activates MLKL and MLKL is the terminal effector of necroptosis, which relocates to the plasma membrane to cause plasma membrane rupture. So this is what we know to date again. Just as a, at a glance, there's a lot of uh, virus proteins that have been shown to inhibit the necroptotic signaling machinery. Um, but really what it's been shown is that there's these RIM-containing proteins uh, that bind RIP kinases. There's this uh, ZRNA sensor, ZBP1, which recruits RIPK3 to activate RIPK3, which then phosphorylates MLKL to activate MLKL and induce 
plasma membrane damage. As I alluded to before, there's TNF combined RIPK1, RIPK3, and then there's toll-like receptor proteins, which sense in the case of TLR4, bacterial LPS, or in the case of TLR3, double-stranded RNA from viruses. And through their RIM domain containing protein TRIF, this again can re-recruit RIPK3 to activate MLKL and cause necroptosis. So how is necroptosis blocked in cells? Well, these papers showed here, it's actually apoptotic signaling that blocks necroptosis. So this is where it gets a bit complicated, but it was observed a long time ago that if you knock out caspase-8 in mice, this was embryonic lethal. Um, so these mice died before they were born. And then in 2011, and then subsequently in 2016, it was shown if you cross these mice to RIPK3 knockouts to block a necroptosis or MLKL knockouts to block necroptosis, you now get viable mice. So this really proved that caspase 8 is an essential inhibitor of necroptotic signaling. Still not clear exactly what the substrates are, although it's known that caspase 8 can at least in vitro cleave RIPK3 and also RIPK1 in. I guess I'll just highlight here one caveat to these uh, Murray models um, is that you actually have caspase 8 deficiency in people, and this is not lethal. So these people actually suffer from infections, they're immunodeficient, and they can also suffer from very early onset inflammatory bowel disease. So although while caspase 8 is essential for development in mice, in humans it's not. And this could be because there's some redundancy with caspase 10, which is also thought to act similarly to caspase 8. And caspase 10 is only present in humans. Um, nevertheless, a lot of um, work has started to be done, has been done to investigate the role of necroptosis in uh, infections. But as you'll appreciate here, this is probably necroptosis because it depends you have to lose, in most cases, you have to lose caspase 8 to trigger necroptosis. So it might be a backup mechanism for the host cell to kill itself if a pathogen inhibits caspase 8. Because um, you can see here in a lot of these infections, if you look at the RIPK3 knockouts or MLKL knockout, um, there's not much difference in survival levels compared to the inflammasome knockouts in response to, say, staph infection, Yersinia infection. In, in viruses, again, there's, you know, you're starting to get some differences in these RIPK3 knockouts, but I'll just highlight here, it's known that RIPK3 can activate apoptosis as well. So really the ongoing work is really trying to use the MLKL knockouts, which are only deficient in necroptosis, to study the response to these infections. Because when you knock out RIPK3, you can actually block apoptotic signaling as well. So it's not definitive proof that necroptosis is involved in any particular model, you really got to use the MLKL knockouts. Nevertheless, it's now um, there's been a fair bit of study in how necroptosis can actually signal inflammatory responses. And a lot of this has been done by conditionally deleting caspase 8 in different tissues and cell types. And this is one study that's worth highlighting here where they deleted uh, caspase 8 um, from dendritic cells. And then they injected these mice lacking caspase 8 in dendritic cells here in red with LPS and showed that these succumbed or were sensitive to endotoxin challenge. And this appeared to be a necroptotic cell death and it was subsequently shown to be RIPK3 and MLKL dependent. Here's just an example where you take the RIPK3 knockouts now and now if you lose caspase 8, these are com completely protected from LPS challenge. And it's quite surprisingly at the time everyone thought, well, you know, necroptosis, it's mainly driven by TNF. But no, if you block TNF signaling, these mice still die. And it's really only if you block IL-1 signaling here in blue that you get survival. So this suggested here that necroptosis could signal to, the, to an inflammasome to activate specifically IL-1 beta to cause disease lethality. And what appeared the student we showed at the time uh, back in 2017, this is that when you get um, MLKL being activated, you get these uh, and membrane damage. This results in potassium ion efflux from these cells, and this potassium ion efflux nucleates the NIP3 inflammasome specifically to generate this pro-inflammatory R1 beta response. 
And this has subsequently been shown to hold true in other necroptotic models. And here's just one example here. Um, and this is where they've deleted A20. And A20 mutations have been implicated in a huge variety of autoimmune and arthritis, uh, autoimmune and inflammatory conditions in humans, one of them being arthritis. So here they've modeled A20 mutations by deleting it. And you can see these mice that, well, I haven't shown pictures, but they develop very severe arthritis. And it's been previously shown that this arthritis is IL-1 beta dependent. But you can see here, um, if you measure the uh, thickness of the pores or bone erosion, now if you delete RIPK3 in blue or MLKL, you really protect from arthritis, showing that A20 mutations or loss of A20 can drive arthritis through necroptosis. And because this is blocked with R1 beta, they looked at R1 beta and again, deleting MLKL or necroptosis reduced R1 beta levels in these mice. Uh, and this is the, the reason why these no longer get arthritis. So these are just two examples of, well, one example of the mechanism by which necroptotic MLKL can drive pathological inflammatory responses. So what's the next frontier? Um, this was huge. Uh, this, this was a couple of years ago. Um, you'd think these gazodermin D pores, that's the end of the story. They, they, you know, you have a pore in the cell, you get, you know, plasma membrane damage, you get water influx, cells swell, cells lies, inflammation. And what Vishwadixit's group showed, they, they showed actually um, that this plasma membrane ruptures or cell lysis is controlled by NINJ1 or NINJ1 activation. And what they showed, and I'll show a bit of data on the next slide, was that gazodermin D pores or apoptosis activates NINJ1. And this is a recent uh, paper which uh, started to characterize the the large polymeric structure of NINJ1 pores or that can cause plasma membrane rupture downstream of pyroptosis and apoptosis. And here's an example, NINJ1, it's required for membrane rupture, but it does not prevent cell death. And here's the data here, or some of the data. So if you look at LDH release, this is a cytoplasmic protein, quite a large one, over 100 kilodaltons, um, and that's released upon plasma membrane rupture. And if you knock out NINJ1 here in red, you can see in response to all these pyroptotic stimuli here, this really reduces LDH release, as does gazodermin D loss. But this is downstream of gazodermin deactivation. You can see here in NINJ1 knockouts, you still get gazodermin D N-terminal pore formation similar to wild-type control cell, showing that NINJ1 oligomerizes to induce plasma membrane rupture downstream of pore formation. And so because you get this pore formation, you still get cell death. So this is a cell death marker here. This is a small a fluorescent compound that can be taken up into cells upon the comprom upon a compromised plasma membrane. And you can see here in NINJ1 knockouts, here in red, you still get uh, an uptake of this cell death marker through the gazodermin D pore. Whereas in the gazodermin D knockouts here, if you don't longer have the gazodermin D pore, you no longer get cell death as shown here, you no longer get uptake of this cell death marker. Um, they've just recently published, literally a week ago, that if you knock out NJ1 in the liver, and in this liver injury model uh, caused by TNF um, injection, um, again, you reduce serum LDH. When you knock out NJ1, you reduce uh, liver enzymes present in the serum. Um, but what's really interesting here, you're not really protecting against lethality in the NINJ1 knockout. So this is the survival of mice in this model. So although you're reducing tissue injury in this model, you're not impacting survival. And the same is in response to this other model they used in the past. So the question is, I guess I'll just leave it at this. Um, the really question is, how can we use this knowledge now you know, we have these small molecules, but how can we tune intracellular cell death signaling pathways? And one of the things we're, we're trying to get going at WEHI, and there's a number of groups is now on the back of these, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, where they use these lipid nanoparticles to package mRNA to vaccinate against SARS-CoV-2, is can we um, now put in known cell death inhibitors or activators 
to develop new therapies. So you can imagine, and it's been shown proof of principle, but in studies have been shown, well, we could um, package mRNA formulations with cell death effectors, such as activated gazdermin D and MLKL. And this is thought to promote tumor immune responses. You could even package them with mRNAs encoding IAP antagonists, such as SMAC, to promote tumor cell death. And again, some studies have been shown that this is possible. You can package mRNA for wild type 53. So P53 is mutated in around half of cancers. So in theory, if you can direct your lipid nanoparticles to the tumor, you could potentially restore wild type P53 function in, um, in P53 mutant tumors. You know, what we're interested in is um, these uh, antibodies or called nanobodies. They have antibody affinity and specificity, but they can be expressed inside cells. So in theory, you know, you could package the mRNA for nanobodies in, that can target cancer oncogenes or pro-survival proteins to again promote cancer cell death. You can in fact express cell death inhibitors to block patho pathological cell death, say neurodegeneration or liver injury by expressing say BCLX cell C flip um, to block apoptosis. So this is an all alternative perhaps to small molecules which can take decades to develop and also often lack specificity and often are tissue targeted. So you can add antibodies onto the surface of lipid nanoparticles to target them potentially to different tissues and cell types. And with that, I think we're almost at the hour, so happy to take any questions. talk. Do you know anything about caspase 10 levels in those human cases which are caspase 8 deficient or mutant? Caspase 10 in? Yeah. So in those case, in the human cases which are caspase 8 deficient and they have early onset, you know, IBS or whatever, do you know anything about caspase 10 levels in those patients? No, no, no that hasn't been looked at. I can tell you that caspase 10, uh, there's been an identification of caspase 10 caspase 10 mutations in humans and they develop a auto lymphoproliferative disease. Um, but it's quite distinct from caspase 8 deficient patients, which are also unlike caspase 10 deficiency, caspase 8 mutant patients have immunodeficiency, have infections and inflammatory bowel disease. So this, they're not completely redundant. So just because I've got a special interest, so in the head and neck cancers, which are being treated for, with SMAC memetics, um, it has actually been shown to increase the five-year survival in those patients. But what hasn't been shown is that um, the types of patients who, who might um, benefit more in terms of the mutations that those have, and also that those patients had chemotherapy and radiotherapy, which are thought to also enhance the effects of SMAC memetics. So given that that's the case for that cancer, do you think the other can cancers could similarly benefit from SMAC memetics if they were more targeted and given with chemotherapy and radiotherapy? Uh, yeah, I think like all these single compound SMAC medic trials sort of failed or petered out. They didn't show great responses. And I think the only trials left, uh, you probably know better than me, the only trials left are the combination therapy trials. Um, but I think, again, they probably, they need some targeting, you know, defining whether these cancers are going to be TNF responsive. That's, in my mind, my, that's the main thing to, if the SMAC medics are going to work, they should be uh, a TNF responsive cancer type. I 
don't know if G is allowed to ask questions. <laughs> Can I? <laughs> Even though I've already been in this area for several years, but sometimes I also get very confused. That's why I ask a question. So um, I think, you know, the different kinds of program the cell desk looks very fancy and um, well designed. But I want to ask your opinion about in the real situation, do you think for example, in one disease, is only one program the cell does play roles, or they all combine each other to induce a final result? You got me. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it it'll be disease specific. So at least a lot of mouse studies are starting to come out. You can knock out just gazdermin D, and you prevent inflammatory I1 beta release, and you protect against disease. And it'll also be. Um, there will be a gene dosage effect here. So say, for example, in NLP3 autoactivating mice, which mimic NLP3 activating mutations in people, it's been shown uh, uh, they knocking out gazdemma D completely protects from disease. But if you introduce a more severe NLP3 autoactivating mutation, then gazdemma D no longer protects. Um, and there's, again, that brings in with this increased activity of NELP3, there's potential there to bring in other cell death players such as caspase 8 and gazdermin E. Um, so it'll be very disease specific, I think. <laughs> I think you need to offer money instead of chocolates. <laughs> Imagine if you had $50 notes to give out. <laughs> um, I have a question about the side effects of the um, of the therapies, which you can induce the cell death. I'm wondering whether this therapies could also induce autoimmunity in these patients, because um, excessive cell apoptosis can induce autoimmunity by any chance. Is there any uh, like incidents or reports about this? I'm, I'm not aware of that exactly. That's a bit outside my expertise. I guess it's one possibility. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if anyone wants to chime in. Maybe. No. So do we have any more questions from the floor? No last questions? <laughs> okay. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to thank James um, for doing today's seminar. Um, so let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks.